you've given us such a wonderful word to behold, to consider, to think about. God, I pray you'd help us to think deeply tonight, to, to dig into the scripture and to be made wiser, to, to be able to apply it to our lives, to think rightly about you and who you are, and what you've done for us, what you promised you would do. Um, we thank you, God. Just pray your blessing on this study tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're back in Deuteronomy 21. This is my third week in this chapter, but I'm going through it slower because it, it's uh, the case laws, and I'm not going to read the whole chapter all over again, but I will open with the same scripture from the New Testament that I've done the last few times in 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So 2 Timothy 3.16. I'll just keep reading that for probably for a bit. Uh, take note, 3.16. You know John 3.16. Makes it kind of easy to remember this address. It's 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17. Uh, people love to quote it for the first part, that all Scripture is breathed. God breathed. It's theanoustos. It's, it's exhaled by God. Uh, we get the word inspired, inspiration from the word that's used here. It's, it's breathed out. It's inspired. Or some have said expired, but we use the word expired for things that go bad or dead. But literally exhaled. It's theanoustos. It's God breathed. But what I like to call attention to is that the primary focus of what he's talking about is the Old Testament. And what does he say about the Old Testament? Not, not that it isn't 100% true of the New. It absolutely is. But at the time this is being written, the New Testament isn't even completed yet. And he says, all Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable. And that's good to look at because so many in our generation want to throw away the Old Testament. A very popular Andy Stanley, that heretic, um, we, he, he's, he's wanting to get rid of the Old Testament. Shame, shame on him. Let his name be, be, be mud and his house made into a dunghill. Um, but it's it read out and it's profitable for teaching, for reproof. That means you can take case laws and you should be able to go to, one, go to each other and say, hey, look, Deuteronomy 21 says this and we should be reproved by it, right? If, it, if somehow... Our life isn't, we should be able to take principles from there and actually look at our life and go, oh, wow, I'm not honoring God as I should or honoring my wife as I should or my children as I should or thinking rightly for correction, for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So the Old Testament as well as the New is, is God-breathed and is able to equip us for every good work. And there's so many things that God does not repeat in the New Testament from the Old Testament. Which means if you don't read it and you don't study it and churches don't preach on it, we are not equipped to every good work. We are not equipped to build a social order based upon a biblical ethic. We are not equipped to think rightly in the political sphere and economics in terms of family, in terms of work, in terms of the environment, in terms of inheritance. And, and the church doesn't think about these things. The church, today's church, has virtually no social theory. What do I mean by social theory? I mean, when it comes to how do you, how do you uh, organize a society? How do, you, how, do you, how, how do we get married? I mean, the church is just kind of like, yeah, whatever the culture says. As long as it has anything to do with how to get to heaven, we don't care. You know, you just kind of do whatever's right in your own eyes. But that's not the way that Paul approaches the Old Testament or the Scripture. He ap approaches it as, as uh, equipping us for every good work so that we can learn to think rightly about God's world. And, and as Christian men and women, we can build Christian culture, Christian civilization, Christian families, Christian businesses, and we can think rightly about these things. So uh, I love studying this. It stretches us because they're case laws. And case laws, I believe, many of the case laws, to the original audience, they would read it and they'd scratch their head. You're supposed to scratch your head. You're supposed to go, man, that is so counterintuitive, but it's the inspired Word of God, so there must be something in this that I need to learn. And, and it's supposed to stretch us. And we're to think about it. And, and it. and it should challenge us. It's a case law. It's not, 
It's not as straightforward as the Ten Commandments in, in some ways. Maybe I'm using the wrong word there. But it's designed to make you think, identify the principle, and you can apply it to many, many situations that aren't even found, uh, that, that aren't directly what the, what the text is talking about. So you'll see Paul doing that. He'll, he'll quote verses about not muzzling oxes and apply it to uh, people. So you, you know it can be used that way because the New Testament uses that way. So, all right, here I'm going to read part of Deuteronomy 21. We've already gone through the first part a couple times. I'm not going to re- redo the part about the body found laying in the field, which I preached on several weeks ago. But starting in Deuteronomy 21.10, When you go out to war against your enemies, and Yahweh your God gives them into your hand, and you take, uh, and, and you take them captive, and you see among the captives a beautiful woman, and you desire to take her to be your wife, and you bring her home to your house, she shall shave her head and pare her nails, and she shall take off the clothes in which she was captured, and shall remain in your house and lament her father and her mother a full month. After that, you may go into her and be her, her husband, and she shall be your wife. But if you no longer delight in her, you shall not let her go where she wants, or you shall let her go where she wants. But you shall not sell her for money, nor shall you treat her as a slave, since you have humiliated her. If a man has two wives, the one loved and the other unloved, and both the loved and the unloved have borne him children. And if the firstborn, firstborn son belongs to the unloved, then on the day when he assigns his possessions as an inheritance to his sons, he may not treat the son of the loved as the firstborn in preference to the son of the unloved, who is the firstborn. But he shall acknowledge the firstborn, the son of the unloved, by giving him a double portion of all that he has, for he is the firstfruits of his strength. The right of the firstborn is his." If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and though they discipline him, will not listen to them, then his father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of his city at the gate of the place where he lives, and they shall say to the elders of the city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey your voice, our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of the city shall stone him with, to death with stones, so you shall purge the evil from your midst." And all Israel shall hear and fear. And if a man has committed a crime punishable by death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him the same day. For a hanged man is cursed by God. You shall not defy your land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. Now, I'm sorry, folks, that weren't here last week, but we talked the entire time about when a man takes a wife that's a captive because she's a beautiful woman and brings her home and makes her a wife. We talked about that a long time last week. And I'll just, I'll just say a few points briefly because I don't want to focus on it. I read it for the context of the next verses. The next verses we're going to cover tonight is about when a man has um, a second marriage. It doesn't say necessarily at the same time, but just simply a second marriage. So this is something we go through now. Where a man has a first wife has a son by him, he's the firstborn. Then he has a second wife, has a son after that. And he doesn't love the first wife, but he does love the second wife. And so that kind of love is transferred over to his children. He says that the right of the firstborn, the double portion right, which we'll talk about, is that he's not to be disinherited because you love the other boy's mother more. That's not to happen. And we're going to talk about the significance of that a little bit. Um, and right before that, it's interesting to me, it talks about this choosing a woman to be a wife from among the captives. And I, I think maybe one reason why the one passage follows the other is if, if a person did get married in haste to someone who was, uh, uh, he married a captive, a foreigner, he may have a child by her and in the future uh, that marriage not work out for whatever reasons or he marries a second woman and he's more likely to, to despise that wife. So uh, it's interesting that the one passage follows the other. But we talked last week about how God puts distance between... Uh, God says that in order to have a woman who is, who is a, a captive in a battle, he could not take her like often happens on battlefields. People get raped. Women are very badly treated. He has to marry her. She has to become a wife. And he can't do it there. He has to, first of all, bring her all the way home. And we, we showed how it was in a faraway country. That gives time to do what? To get to know her and to think about it. Then he brings her into his house. That gives opportunity for what? 
the family to get to know her, to get the input from mother and father and brothers and sisters and community. It's like, wow, we were talking to this girl. She's really shallow. She doesn't know Yahweh. She's really confused, and she seems like a nasty, bitter person. Don't marry her, right? Um, and, and then she also had 30 days to do what? To mourn. And while she's mourning, what does she look like? She's bald. She looks like Daniel. And, and, and she <laughs> shaved head, paired nails. And, and so that gave, what that was, it symbolizes a new beginning. It's a time of mourning. But also, we took note of the fact that it says, if you see among the captives a beautiful woman. It's a very shallow motivation. It's not her character. It's that she's, she's a beautiful woman. And so it's very impulsive. God is putting all kinds of barriers to an impulsive marriage. He has to walk back with her, get to know her, has to bring her into the family. The family gets to know her. Um, she has time to mourn. She has her head shaved. She's not looking as pretty as she was when she was taken captive in the first place. This gives all kinds of, of, a, of a buffer time period to let the rational brain take over. But you know what? Maybe there are a few women in his hometown. Maybe he's not very desirable to Jewish girls. He can't find a wife anywhere. And maybe she is a gift from God who quickly adopts faith and, and just has a, like, like, a, like a, a Ruth or a Rahab, a woman that's a woman of faith, even she, though she's from another country. And so it wasn't, it wasn't forbidden. It was allowed. But there's all kinds of barriers. And we applied it last week that a lot of times people make very rash decisions based upon looks, based upon their hormones, based upon feeling desperate or super lonely. And it's good to have a time period to get to know the person. It's good to have the counsel of your family members. And, and uh, it's good to see the character. So we talked a little bit about that last week. And, and I just put it there for the context because really what we're getting to today is verse 21. And I hope to get to the end of the chapter and now we're dealing with what's called the law of primogenitor. Let's, let's read it here. If a man has two wives, the one loved and the other unloved. Hebrew is more blatantly says the other hated, uh, which, which is kind of hyperbolic, but despised. So, you know, when you read this, you first think, ah, polygamy again. Well, it could also be something very common to us, um, divorce and remarriage, which honestly isn't much different than polygamy. It, it is a difference because divorce, God, the God's word does acknowledge divorce. It does. Um, it does acknowledge, it says don't, it says don't do it uh, except for certain grounds, but it does acknowledge that it can be done. It, says it, it doesn't say it can't be done. The marriage bond can be broken, but it's not God's original intent. Jesus says in Matthew 19, it was for the hardness of men's heart that he permits them to divorce their wives. It was never God's desire, but God deals with a world of sinners and we have a society of difficult people and, and uh, rebellious people. And so in the case of a divorce, a man has to give his wife a writing of divorcement so that she can prove, yes, that no good guy divorced me. So um, anyway, it could be a divorce situation, could be a polygamous situation. But in any case, the man has two wives, the one loved and the other unloved or hated. And both the loved and the hated have borne him children. And if the firstborn son belongs to the unloved, then on the day when he assigns his possessions as an inheritance to his sons, he may not treat the son of the loved as the firstborn in preference to the son of the unloved who is the firstborn. But he shall acknowledge the firstborn, the son of the unloved, by giving him a double portion of all that he has, for he is the firstfruits of his strength, the right of the firstborn is his." So this is called the, the law of primogeniture. Uh, primogeniture is a system of inheritance in which a person's property passes to their firstborn legitimate child upon their death. The term comes from Latin primo, which means first, and genitura, which relates to a person's birth. So, in, in, and like in England, the firstborn would get it all. In biblical law, the firstborn son in particular would get a double portion. So, for example, if he had two sons... Uh, the inheritance would be divided into three parts, and the firstborn would get two-thirds, and the second one would get the, the final third. And, and so it would be if he had seven sons, then it's divided into eight parts, and the firstborn gets two of the eight. So it just means he gets a double portion of whatever amongst the sons. 
And um, what often came with this, though, was the understanding that the firstborn was responsible to take care of his parents in the older years. This was like the heir. This was the heir to the family estate. And so it was kind of like the, 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 um, the legal heir to, to, the, to the family fortune. Others would get, uh, would get gifts, but he would get the majority uh, example. Now what's fascinating is there's a bunch of cases in Scripture where this law by God, with God's um, condoning, the firstborn is passed over. So like, for example, you've got... Uh, some I, I came to my mind. Isaac was chosen over Ishmael. And Abraham others had other sons. Keturah had a wife, had a wife after Sarah died named Keturah. And, and had like eight children by her and sent them away with gifts. And it was a way of saying you're not an heir. The, the, the estate goes to Isaac. The promise is to Isaac, but he sent them away with gifts. And then you have Jacob was chosen over Esau. Jacob continued to live with his father. Esau went to Seir, went to Edom, and kind of started his own thing. Then, then you've got um, Jacob. His first son did something very wicked. And uh, let's see, I always get, the, get them confused. I think it was Reuben. Um, Reuben did something wicked. And so he kind of go, uh, goes over to, to Joseph and Joseph's two sons were adopted and received, Ephraim and Manasseh, were adopted and given a portion as sons. So you've got a situation there, which, which we can talk about more as we get later in the chapter either, even. Um, then we got a case where Caleb was actually a, an Edomite, the son of Jephunneh. He's a, adopted in the tribe of Judah. And then later on, Caleb adopts a man named Othniel, who is his son-in-law, and he becomes an heir. So if we go back to this, it says that it's still in the day that he assigns, he assigns it. There's still, there's still parental discretion in this. But, but the, um, the expectation was the firstborn from his birth has the responsibility of taking care of the aging parents and that they would take on the, the vast amount of the, the, the parental estate. They were the heir to... They were like the, the kind of like kings would have, a, they, you can only have one king after you, so they would pass it on to their son. It wouldn't be a shared thing. It would have the, the firstborn would, would have that double portion. It would be the heir of the estate. But, uh, but, but there are a lot of cases, it's almost the norm that the firstborn got passed over in God's plan. But legally, the firstborn, if he was a godly individual, that was willing to take on the responsibilities of the firstborn, he received a double portion of the inheritance. Rush Dooney points out that while on the cross, Jesus is dying, and he asked John to take his place as the one responsible for his mother. He assigns the care of his mother to John the Beloved, while on the cross. And it, in Jewish law, even dying words of an executed person was legally binding. If they couldn't write it out, it was legally binding. They're dying words. So when Jesus says, man, behold your mother, woman, behold your son, what he's doing is a legal transfer of John is the heir of my household. Take care of my mother for me. So that's kind of, the, kind of what's going on here. Um, do we got any... Uh, I kind of lost my place in my notes because it came off the screen. Um, let me read this one more time, and then if you have comments, let's read it one more time because I left the page. If a man has two wives, the one loved and the other unloved, and both the loved and the unloved have borne him children, and the firstborn son belongs to the unloved, then on the day when he assigns his possessions as an inheritance to his sons, he may not treat the son of the loved as the firstborn in preference to the son of the unloved who is the firstborn. But he shall acknowledge the firstborn, the son of the unloved, by giving him a double portion of all that he has, for he is the firstfruits of his strength. The right of the firstborn is his. Any comments on that thus far? Here, here's a thought. It's something interesting Thomas Sowell. I, I heard Thomas Sowell say one time, statistically, um, if you take all, if you take first people with firstborns, <laughs> I almost hate to say this publicly, 
statistically, firstborns have oftentimes the highest IQ, which is interesting. And Thomas Sowell, you know, see, I knew you'd be smiling. <laughs> That's why I didn't say it. Uh, but firstborn, why do you think? Why do you think firstborn? It's not genetics. Why would the firstborn have a higher IQ? It's a theory. You know, you know be right or wrong. I'll, I'll tell you Thomas Sowell's, but maybe you have a theory. You got an idea? What'd you say? I think that's a very good theory. I, Zach, uh, Zach says they take on more responsibility. And then what'd you say, Josiah? You mean when they're bored, the less just... Absolutely. Would you have a similar thought, Chris? Yep. And that's what Thomas Sowell says. I wish we had the mic runner. Where's Victoria? Do you have the mic? All right, you gotta, we got to get the bike. Um, why don't you take it back over to Chris and let him summarize those thoughts. I didn't see. I couldn't see where you were. Because <laughs> people listen online, they can't hear anything. You're yeah, saying. there's been a lot of studies on that. And, and while there's always exceptions, the larger the family, sometimes those later children become more resilient in a lot of ways because they had to do more things on their own, right? And so the high IQ is a real, can be a real blessing, Um but a lot of times those first kids can go through other things, struggles too. Yep. So, yeah, I mean, it's just a matter of, um, but I think that first child gets a lot. I know in our house, McKenna got a whole lot of <laughs> extra stuff from mom and dad in terms of attention and books and things because she was the first, you know. Right. I don't know where her IQ ranks, and I would never guess. But Yeah, and, and, I, and, and, I, and I wanted to make a point of it, more than an interesting fact. It shows you that, that there's conditioning involved. And, and so as we get into even what comes in the rest of the chapter, yeah, the firstborn is getting lots of, they have, they, they have the sole attention of, of mom in particular, and mom and dad. And so there's a lot, they're reading to them a lot, they're doing a lot. And then when you have, when you have, sorry, have more children, you just, of necessity, you're taking care of more things. Now there's benefits to being the second and the third and the fourth too. There's certain benefits to that as well. Uh, a lot of times the second was like, I, I'm going to do, I want to compete for the attention. And therefore, a lot of the second, th there's interesting characteristics to, to, to birth order that, that, you know, I'm not an expert and I won't go into. But what I will say is that um, what follows even after this about the execution of a stubborn and rebellious son, which comes up later in the chapter, I don't think it's a coincidence they're side by side. And one thing I, I want to say it is, especially we have so many parents with young children, to be very self-conscious about the teaching and the training of even your newborns. I, 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 one thing that I, I think makes a, a big difference is parents who really talk to their children. And I'm really, I'm really, I was always real big on not doing the baby voice overly with your children. Like talk mature talk with your children. Don't, don't you, know, do, 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 do. you do too much of that. And you're, you're wasting opportunity. You know, like you might be saying, oh, we're putting on your socks and we're putting on your pants and just talking to them about everything. Talking while you're driving, talking while you're dressing them, talking while you're, you're bathing, laughing with them, pouring lots of attention into them and speak to them like they're, you know, using, using high vocabulary at times. Um, even as the child grows up, using large, you know, using good grammar, using good vocabulary words, and and it's just you, and, and that's one of the. I think one of the advantages of, of of homeschooling is that children spend more time with adults than with children. Now, a, a child in a class may have a teacher who's giving a great lecture, who's very intellectual and very smart, and that certainly has its benefits in certain ways too. But, um, but walking with the wise and you will grow wiser. And I, I just, so I would just encourage you young parents to be very intentional. Even as the second and the third comes along, uh, I, IQ and all of that isn't just genetic. 
it, it is something, the amount you put into, be very intentional to speak to them, speak the word of God to them, talk about the Lord, talk about the things of God, bring them in church and let them worship God with you. All those things, I think, make a big difference. Um, the other thing is, though, usually, typically, does the firstborn, the firstborn bears the burden of the family more than the later in my own case, I've got six kids. So when we, when we had Josiah living in Texas, we were living on a thousand a month and, and a church provided housing. You know what I mean? <laughs> we were getting, we, the church had a food pantry and we ate out of the, the food pantry. So I got to spend a lot of time with him that, in that year we lived in Texas. But, uh, but we were poor, right? So a lot of the early years in your youth, you're, a lot of times in your youth, your dad's working a lot of extra hours just trying to put food on the table, pay the bills. As you get older, you start getting over the hill, metaphorically, which I used to think was a bad thing, but it means that the hard, the hard financial part of your life gets done. So by the time six comes along, Eliza's living high on the hog in comparison to my younger children. They lived with me through the very poor years. You see what I'm saying? So the, the, the last-born child has certain advantages that the first-born doesn't have, and the first-born child has advantages that the last-born child doesn't have. God gets to determine all of that. But wherever you are in the birth order, there's, there's advantages and disadvantages to whatever order you come in. But uh, the firstborn, when that, you know, by the time number six is coming along, uh, firstborn's 13, 14, working on the farm, pulling weeds, moving rocks. And then by the time, by the time the, the, the last one comes along, they get to be 14, 15. It's like, hey, this is great. I live in this nice new house and all the rocks are pulled out of the field. So in fairness, the firstborn actually bears the burden of their parents' life because they're, contri they're contributors. Our children aren't merely uh, um, what are, uh, consumers. They're producers. And they work with the family. They work together as the family. So the firstborn getting a double portion, you think about it, they also did the most work to build the family fortune to begin with. And that's oftentimes missed in our modern age. But in ancient times, that firstborn was helping the family out when the family was just getting started on the family farm. You see my point? Any, any thoughts on this or comments on this? You want, you want to give the mic, Stephen? So this is more around the divorce idea, um, which I don't know is explicitly mentioned here. But one thing that we've talked about before is that there's there's no guardrails around marriage in our culture anymore in our society you know legally there's no teeth to make a marriage mean anything societally there's no teeth you know there's no social pressure you know it used to be you know oh they got divorced and nobody talked about it now it's it's common talk it's encouraged it's celebrated you know all kinds of terrible things um, but I think in this law God is putting some more teeth around uh, marriage you know, because if you're if you're a man and you're thinking, man, I really don't like this this woman anymore. I'm just going to leave her. I've got kids with her. Who cares? I'm just going to leave them. Whatever. But in the back of your mind, if this law is enforced and you realize, okay, wow, this son that I had with her, I'm going to have to give a double portion of my inheritance to. Um, I think part of the intent of this law is to make men really double, you know doubt them, you know, question themselves. Like, do I really just want to run away from this marriage because I'm going to have to give a double portion of my inheritance to my children from this marriage? Hey, maybe Excellent. I should actually try to stick around and make this thing work. Yeah. And I think that's, like you said, it's, it's intentional that God put this passage right after the prior one because I think that's the exact, same, the exact same thing there is, you know, God's putting some teeth and some, some guardrails around the institution of marriage as there should be. As he does multiple times. I think yep. this is just another example of that. Yep, which is something I would love to see restored in our society is, is putting, like, no-fault divorce has been just horrendous. You want to give the mic to Ken, Victoria? Uh, I just had a question. So what did they do if the man only had daughters? How did this apply then? Or if his The daughters would be heirs? Or if the firstborn was daughters and not sons. I think firstborn, notice it says firstborn son okay. uh, at the end of verse 15. 
Uh, firstborn was a son. It wasn't firstborn daughter. The daughter might be the firstborn in birth order, which everything I said about, you know, more time spent would apply there as well. But, um, but the firstborn son is what it's referred to. Their, their responsibility was to take on the heir of the estate. And uh, there is a case in the book of Numbers, chapter 27, where uh, this man, Zelophehad, doesn't have any sons. He only has daughters. And she, um, the, the, the daughters um, become heirs. They just have to marry within the tribe. They couldn't marry outside the tribe because they didn't want land to transfer from one tribe to another. The inheritance had to stay within the tribe. They could marry anybody within the tribe, and they would, the, the line would continue through the daughters. So daughters could receive an inheritance. And in the case of Caleb, Caleb has a daughter. I, I forget her name at the moment. Aksaf, I think, uh, and and Aksaf um, requests of her father, I want an inheritance. I want I want a blessing, which really blessing and, and inheritance is a Russian. He says is kind of a synonymous word at times, not synonymous word, but the the blessing and the inheritance go, they go together in a lot of Hebrew thought. And and she says, please give me a blessing. What she's saying is, give me some inheritance. Her husband Othniel. Gets, gets these upper and lower springs. So and effectively, Caleb adopts Othniel, and Othniel, his, his son-in-law, becomes an heir among his children. And Othniel becomes a great... He, he, he got the woman because he was a great, a great man and, uh, and, a, and a warrior. And he ends up becoming the first judge of Israel. So it's, it's important enough that it's mentioned in two places, both in the book of Numbers and it's mentioned in the book of Judges which illustrates something, that there is discretion here, even discretion to give to a daughter and, and, and discretion to adopt a son. Or in the case of Jacob, he adopted his grandsons as heirs amongst his sons. And I, I think part of the reason why, and you see in some of these cases, is Esau wasn't a, wasn't a very godly man. Wasn't a godly man. It's called a profane fornicator in Hebrews. Uh, Ishmael was passed over for Isaac. And Ishmael... For I don't know how godly he was or wasn't, really. Um, and then Reuben, his firstborn, the beginning of his strength, he calls him, was uh, not very go- did some ungodly things. And as a consequence, the, the sons of, um, of uh, Joseph got like a double portion. So anyway, uh, let me look a little bit about Christ here. Because this concept of the firstborn being the heir, but in the case of a king, they're the heir of like the whole kingdom, right? So this term firstborn is used of Jesus a lot. And Jehovah's Witnesses like to point out and say, aha, firstborn, that means there was a time when Jesus didn't exist. No, we're talking about inheritance here. So let's look at a few scriptures on it. Hebrews 1, 1, first chapter, first verse. Long ago, and many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. Now, who created the world? God. God the Son created the world. So there is never a time when the Son did not exist. He created all things, and he's the heir of all things. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the words of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior as angels, as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. That's quoting Psalm 2. Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn of the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the sun, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. This makes it very clear that Jesus is God, that Jesus is the creator, and yet he's called the son and the heir of all things. Heir here is a reference to his position of authority as the heir over everything. And it's called his kingdom, right? So heir here is not, it's, it's, it's applied to Christ as 
the rightful heir of everything. And heaven and earth belongs to him. Also, uh, the, the angels, another name for the angels are the sons of God. So among all the sons, he is the unique heir of all things. So when I look at this, when I look, look at this law about the firstborn being the heir um, and, and he can't be disinherited, uh, I think it kind of pictures Jesus in the sense in which he's the heir of God owns heaven and earth. And as the heir, Jesus is in control of heaven and earth. So that's, that's one thing. Also, um, this phrase, uh, begotten and inheritance. Psalm 2. As, as a chapter, it's the most quoted chapter from the old and the new. Psalm 110 verse 1 is the most quoted verse. But Psalm 2 is very important. It's quoted many times in the New Testament. It says, I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your, inherit, your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. So somebody reads that and says, Ah, oh, today I have begotten you. That means he, he's the, the first begotten. But you know what's interesting is the New Testament quotes this verse in reference to his resurrection, not his incarnation but his resurrection. He's called the first begotten of the dead. Jesus is, his, his being begotten is a reference to his, he was dead and he's been born from the dead in the same way that we will be born from the dead. But he's the first begotten from the dead. An example of this is Colossians 1. He, being Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. He's the firstborn. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. That's a reference to Psalm 2. That, everything he, that in everything he might be preeminent. He's the man in charge. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So Jesus is, was with him at creation, working the family farm, if you will. And he's the first begotten of the dead. And he's the heir of all things. And therefore, he's the head of all principality and power. He is the heir. So in a sense, the, uh, these, these laws about the firstborn being the heir points to Christ because he's called the firstborn and therefore the heir of all things. It's kind of a theme that we might miss if we don't realize the inheritance laws of the Old Testament. Thoughts on that? Yeah? Um, as far as, so with Jesus, the, so with, with um, the firstborn son, they had the they had first fruits as well for their um, fest their uh, not festival festival I don't know other word to for it yeah <laughs> but first they had first fruits. they had first fruits and isn't it that when Jesus rose from the dead that was the day of first fruits yes it was and did you happen to pick up that the word first fruits is used here yes in the in the verse I saw that yep and so I was thinking you know that, first that's, fruits of his strength yeah that's exact that's like what I was thinking is this is really when he real when he gets to realize the position he sits at the right hand of the Father on, you know, on first fruits. First fruits. He, so. he rose from the dead on first fruits as the first begotten of the dead, as the heir of all things. So you're right, they all converge. And I feel I'm kind of rushing through it a little bit. don't know that I'm explaining it the best, but you go into these. I, I could have gone into a lot more case laws on inheritance, but the right of the firstborn was something that, that they were the heir and I think ultimately it points to Christ, who's the heir of all things. And, and when you read in the New Testament, he's the, the, the firstborn. Don't think first created, because Jesus was never created. There's never a time he was not. Think heir. So firstborn doesn't, isn't talking about a, a sequence of events. It's talking about his position as the heir of everything. As, as the, the picture of the father and the firstborn son... Is, is, is a picture of God the Father with God the Son. God the Father with God the Son created all things. And all things have been committed into his keeping. And, and he has authority over all things. So that's, that's kind of, we might miss it if we, didn't, if we didn't read it. Understanding that the concept comes from the Old Testament inheritance laws is, is kind of important. 
Um, okay, so what if, did somebody have their hand raised? I was just add another follow-up question with that, um, with, or I, I guess it's an uh, observation. So if you have, in the Old Testament, you have um, everybody who had the promises, the promises were made to them, but it was for their, their children's children, you know, like, Everybody who had promise, as far as I, I recall, those who had the, the promises, the forefathers who had the promises given to them, they all died and and never got to see, you know, Moses never got to go into the promised land. So I think it, it was just wondering if that's a distinction, that, that only Jesus died, but then also realized the the benefits of, you know, of, of conquering that, because nobody else could conquer death. They all died. And others realized the the benefits, the, realized the promise, whereas Jesus realized realizes his promise through you know through dying and <coughs> resurrection. Right. They looked forward to it, but he actually has it. It, it belongs to him. That's good. All right. So, man, I, I've gone so long into that. I've only got twelve minutes really for eight, but I, I need to go forward. I think, although it's a very interesting passage. Um, what happens though? If your firstborn is just rotten, that's what happens next in the passage here. What? You, you pass the firstborn, exactly. And there's different ways to do that. <laughs> the way that Jews later would do it was read the ceremony of the dead over them, even though they're still alive. But it's interesting that this passage that we're about to read immediately follows that about the firstborn inheritance and the two wives, the one loved, the other hated. Verse 18, if a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and though they discipline him, will not listen to them, then his father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of his city to the gate of the place where he lives. And they shall say to the elders of the city, this our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of the city shall stone him to death with stones. So you shall purge the evil from your midst, and all Israel shall hear and fear. Now this verse is one of those embarrassing verses of the Old Testament that people love to say, oh my goodness, the Bible talks about stoning little children. Does the Bible talk about stoning little children? No, it doesn't. Is this a little children child we're talking about? No. What kind of crimes is this guy committing? This man is stubborn and rebellious, who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and though they discipline him, will not listen to them. Then his father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders, the city gate of the place where he lives, and they shall say to the elders, This our son is stubborn and rebellious, he will not obey the voice. Look at what it says there. He's a glutton and a drunkard. So he's he's been chastised, he's been spanked, he's been through, uh, probably even civilly chastised. And he will not, he just, he's a glutton and a drunkard. This isn't a seven-year-old we're talking about. This isn't a 12-year-old. This isn't a 14-year-old. This is, um, this is a, 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 probably a later teens or whatever. He's a little criminal is what he is. And um, I, I imagine many Hebrew parents would read this to their, <laughs> their rebellious uh, teenage sons. It's like, you know... We could take you down to the elders and get you, you could get, you could get stoned for what you're doing right now. You better shape up. Uh, Chris, you want to take the microphone to Chris? Wait one second. Yeah. Could you elaborate on civilly chastised in your description? Yeah. So, so like one penalty for crimes, most crimes were, were restitution. So if you stole one sheep, you restored two sheep, you know, one ox, you stole, you restored five oxen, which means... You make restitution to the person you stole from. Uh, death penalty offenses, person was put to death. But another penalty was um, 40 lashes, to which they said later on 40 save one because they never wanted to exceed it. But they were the, the, that was a penalty that was done chastising uh, that the elders of the city. If a man be thought worthy of lashes, they shall not exceed 40, which means it doesn't tell us when they would lash it. But let's say there was a guy that was a bully, walk around beating people up. What do you do with him? Well, maybe he needs to give money for breaking somebody's nose. But the other thing is, is you take him down to the town square, you tie him to the post, and you whip him 40 times. The Romans invented the cat of nine tails, which would kill people. 
uh, that that is um, that's not that that would be. In fact, God specifically says it shall not exceed forty, lest you be, he become despised. You're not to beat him to the point that he's a bloody mess. But they would whip him like they did caning. Some of you remember. I, I got to remember the room I'm talking to. I remember when I was a sophomore in high school. There was a lot of discussion because this kid went over to Singapore, an American kid. And he spray painted a car or did something like that. Any of you remember this? Yeah. You all remember this? Oh man! And they were gonna. What were they gonna do to him? Canaan. Canaan. Yep. And the Americans were like, "Oh my goodness, this is horrible. This is child abuse." And uh, I think they they did Canaan, but I don't think they 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 did they went kind of light on him. I think. But um, but they did Canaan. And it's like, yeah, over there in Singapore, people were talking about it. I was like, well, in Singapore, there's no trash on the street. There's no vandalism. There's no crime. There's no broken windows. And it illustrates something that when that chastisement works and that uh, when you show undue pity to criminals, you're actually harsh and incompassionate towards innocent people. Because if you don't restrain evil, you get more of it. And when you restrain evil, beginning with... The, the young child that's stubborn and rebellious, a swat to the back of the legs or, you know, a flick to the, the fingers or whatever. And a, no, no, that's not good. Don't do that. Give them a little flick to their fingers or whatever or slap the back of their legs and you teach them what no is before they can even speak. I, I believe that. Teach them no. And I'll give you an illustration. When a child is, a, a, a child, let's say under even a year old, is angry. Come on, moms, you know what this is. And they go, ah! and they arch their back, and ah, that isn't a sweet little mom, I'm hungry. That is a rebellious, angry thing that's doing. And you just give them a little smack to the back of the leg, and they're like, whoa, when I do that, it's funny, my back of my leg hurts. And they associate this angry, ah, with a, a, a smack to the back of the leg. I don't think that's child abuse. I think it's, I think, uh, I think it's good parenting. You teach them to, you teach them, no, no, we don't do that. You can speak with a sweet voice to them. But you, you smack them on the back of the leg. And you teach them, don't do that. Uh, and as they get older and they're, they're rebellious for rebellion. By the way, I, I don't know how many of you got them, but I hope you got the book, What the Bible Says About Child Training. Read it. That is a very good book. I read it 20 years ago. I think it's a very good book. And it really goes into the biblical, uh, you know, when do you spank and when do you punish with like making the child make restitution, even though maybe they can't financially, they should try to teach them a lesson, right? Um, it's a very good book that kind of lays out some of those details. And part of, the, I think, the point of this scripture is reading this. Every seven years, the whole law was read to all the people. You read this and you go, you know, man, I don't want to take my child to the rock pile. So I'm going to train them while they are early. Now, the parents couldn't put the child to death. The elders had to do so. But you notice the parents had to love God and his word enough to be willing. It, what it does is it shows your ultimate loyalty is to God over even your family. That's, that, that is one of the points of this passage. Is it loyalty to God? You really can't love your, your wife and your children well if you love them more than God. You put God first and your love for wife and children will be in a proper order. You know, if you say, well, I'm going to love my children more than my spouse. Well, actually that's that, that's hurtful to your children. Your children will grow up with the, they won't have the stability of, well, wow, mom and dad are a unit and they work as a unit and they work together. It's good for the child to, for them to know that mom and dads love, love, them, love each other more than they love me. It's a good thing. It creates a, a child-centered home makes unhappy, spoiled children. And a lot of, a whole culture it speaks contrary to that and a lot of people hate their children. They don't like their children. They like to be around their children. They have a child-centered home where the child gets everything they want, every time they whine, every time they, compl they complain. And the children, the parents manipulate the children with lying and promises and everything else. And the children become out of control. And then the parents don't even like their children. They're like, please get that child away from me. So if you restrain them, if they know, no, mom and dad are loyal to each other. And when they speak, they mean it. And there's consequences for disobeying them. What do you end up having? Don't get me wrong, you'll have battles with your children as they're growing, and some children are more difficult than others, to be sure. But your children will, in the end, be much happier than the child that is spoiled. Spoiled children, I've never seen a happy spoiled children. 
they're, they're unhappy, they're ungrateful, they feel entitled, they don't know how to work, they don't get along well with others. So the compassionate thing to do is to train them and discipline them early. Do you, do you want to take the mic? Bring the mic on up here to Dan, sweetie. Um, when I see this, I see Christ in it. Um, because there's a few key words that I see. Um, I see uh, stubborn. Uh-huh. Um, and I see rebellious. Because um, he, he was very stubborn against the Pharisees um, when, when Christ was preaching. Um, and, you and say Christ was, is stubborn? Well, I mean, as in like... Because this is the one that gets executed is the stubborn rebellious one. Okay. Well, I guess I'm not explaining it very well. You're saying that he was strong-willed maybe? or Strong-willed. That, okay. All right. But better term. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but like... You know, like, like they took this 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 person out to the city uh, gate, and and stoned him. And in the same way, they 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 took Christ, right? And and they uh uh uh, fla- uh, uh whipped him, chastised him, whipped him, yes. chastised him. I see. What you're and saying. then they crucified him. Outside the city gate. That, that that's right. They treated him like a, like the vile son. Yes. Very good. I know it's a very good point. I see where you're going with that. They they treated him as because I, I looked up all the words and I, I can't go through all the the difference between um, stubborn is also used to backsliding. It means just refuses to hear, refuses to listen. Rebellious. Uh, the word Hebrew is mara. It means like bitter, but it doesn't mean. Bitter, like we think of bitter. It, it, well, it means rebellious is what it means. <laughs> um, he doesn't respond to chastening. Yeah, God the Son was treated like the stubborn and rebellious son, even though we're the stubborn and rebellious son. And that, that, is, that is a very good application of it, is that we, Adam, is the stubborn son, the firstborn. Adam rebels against God. And we, like Adam, have rebelled against God. And we, like Adam, have been stubborn and rebellious, and the result is we deserve death. But Christ was obedient, and he took the penalty that we deserve. So, very good, very good application. Um, very good. And, and notice that the, the purpose of it is, it says, then all the men, in verse 21, then all the men of the city shall stone him to death with stones, so you shall purge the evil from your midst, and all Israel shall hear and fear. Edersheim, who wrote in the 1800s, and I don't remember if it was Jew, Sketches of Jewish Social Life or one of his other books I have, but he made the point that, that uh, just a stubborn, like to dishonor the aged, which is kind of an um, overall an unheard of thing in Israel at the time of Christ. So the idea being, if this, if this, when this scripture is taught and believed, and taught to children, and taught, if this is a social expectation, it doesn't happen. And if it does happen, it doesn't happen very often. When you have a permissive society that says the right thing to do is to let your child just do whatever they want when they're young because it's they're expressing themselves, what you have is a lot of stubborn rebellion children, and it doesn't end well. So when you read this, people say, oh, that's so harsh. Well, it's not harsh if it never happens because parents care enough to prevent it from happening. You see what I'm saying? You prevent it, it doesn't happen. Um, I'm going to skip over Mark. Uh, I have a scripture in Mark. Here's some scriptures from Proverbs. This is 801. Let me get to some scriptures that deal with this. Proverbs 19:18. Discipline your son, for there is hope. Do not set your heart on putting him to death. Discipline. Now, I like the King James. It says, chasten him early, or chasten him betimes. Chasten him early why there is hope. Uh, do not um, spare for his crying. And it refers to his crying later on in life. And it means, and, and the idiom applies to, to put, putting to death. Uh, but the point being is when, when the child is young and malleable and teachable, while it's early in life, teach him discipline, teach him obedience, 
Teach them the fear of the Lord. Teach them to respect their elders. Teach them to clean their room. Teach them not to shove, not to push, not to call each other nasty names. Teach them to work around the house. Teach them to, to, to be contributors to the household economy. The contrary that's done so often today is spoil the child. Oh, let them enjoy their youth and just sit them in front of Disney all day long and, and don't tell them to do anything and buy them everything that they want and feed them everything they want. Let them get up, go to bed, go to their friends, do whatever they want. And this kind of hands-off parenting is leading to very unhappy people. And later in life, they're depressed they, they don't know how to get along with others. They can't hold down a job. They, get, they get, easily get divorced. They give up when it gets hard because all they know is comfort. They are soft, and they're soft because of permissive parenting. So Proverbs 19.8 says, Discipline your son while there is hope, as King James. Do not spare for his crying, or do not set your heart on putting him to death, referring to the crying that happens when they're going to be led to the rock pile. Proverbs 19, 18, chasten, I mean spank, that was mentioned in the verse. We've spanked him, he didn't listen. Chasten thy son while there is hope, and let not, oh, that's the one, I got, I'm sorry, I got, oh, I put King James up there. I forgot I put it up there. I put ESV, and then King James is, do not spare for his crying. And I like the Hebrew idiom, do not spare for his crying, on one hand, because a lot of times a kid would say, Mommy, Daddy, I know I know you said you spanked me. Please don't, please don't. Well, okay, I'm going to let you go this time. But next time, no. If you said you were going to spank them, and now it's like, oh, I got to spank you. I told you I was going to. And it's the last thing I want to do. I tell you what happens a lot of times, kids, you go out in public place, and they're, they're choosing the place. They're choosing to be, throw a fit in a public place or something. And it's like, listen, we're in the store right now. If you don't stop, you're going to get a spanking when you get home. And then they don't stop. But on the ride home, they're thinking about it. And they're like, oh, man, I don't want to get a spanking. And you get home, it's like, oh, mommy, daddy, please. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. Please don't spank me. Please don't. No, I told you you would. Now I'm going to follow through because mommy and daddy aren't liars. And God's not a liar. And the wages of sin is death. So let's go to the room, put your hands on the bed, and let's get this over with. Because if you spare for his crying today... It'll be his first crying later on. It'll materialize in, in their adulthood when they can't, they can't stick it out in a relationship or they can't, they can't deny themselves because they've never been taught inner restraint. What's that? Yeah, yeah, you can quote Proverbs 19, 18. Do not spare for his crying. <laughs> Proverbs twenty two fifteen. Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. It's bound up. It's like tied in. Uh, you know, I've met a lot of parents that went through a difficult time when they're, you know, two or three. And the, the longer you wait to start, the more difficult it's going to be because you've already shown them that you're not consistent. And it's kind of like for every time you break your word, you you got to redo it right ten times. So be consistently consistent. Folly is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. Uh, I did King James again. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. You train the child. That's not, and, and I don't want to make it sound like spanking is the only thing going on here. It's not. It's just, it's, it's something that gets left out. No, playing with your children, spending time with your children, modeling good, uh, modeling good conduct to your children, clearly telling them what your expectations are, showing them how valuable they are, I, Dobson said that children spell love, T-I-M-E. So, you know, there's, I don't want to sound all harsh here. There's lots of time for playing and having them on your lap and reading to them and taking them places, all of those things. You don't, we don't want to neglect those things. But we, we've been raised in a generation, most of us, when spanking has been frowned upon. And you have to be careful doing it publicly because somebody might, might work for social services and might even be a mandatory reporter and they turn you in because we have such a, a messed up society. You have to be discreet. But it, the, it's, it's the loving thing to do, according to Scripture, is to chasten them early so that you don't take them to the rock pile. That's the idea. Uh, any other comments? We have one more verse to go, but I won't read it, I guess, tonight. Um, maybe we'll have overlap with this again next week. I don't know. Samuel? Um, just 
thought that uh, a thought here is also that um, the the father and the mother were bringing him to the rock pile as well. Like it had, it, you couldn't just have had it where, you know, the father was just really annoyed with the way his son was acting, and maybe his son didn't go the way he wanted him to go as far as you know following in his in his path or whatever. And he's got some idea and he gets angry at his son. And, as what happens with humans, they get rash, and they're like, you know what, you're not my son, you did this this way, you're going to the rock pile, and then the wife would, the, the, at that point, the mother would be like, no, he's not, I'm not going with you, obviously not, like our son's not, you know, that far gone that this needs to happen, so it wouldn't have been something that would have easily happened that way, too, it had to be consent of both, you know, both father and mother, bring him to the rock pile, so I, And it's, and it's, he's known, in, it, it's in the, it's in the city where he yeah. lives, so another application that I'll go into, and maybe I'll go more into it next week, but next it talks about curses the man that hangs on a tree. Another application we can talk about is the civil. If it's true of the family, it would also be true of the society in general for the incorrigible criminal. So let's say, let's say somebody is, uh, uh, they, don't, they haven't murdered anybody, but they're constantly stealing and only one, and they're really they're really smart criminals, so they only don't get caught an occasion. And they figure, well, I make restitution every time I get caught, but I get caught, t- I don't get caught ten times. Crime pays, okay? And likes beating people up, likes vandalizing, likes breaking windows. Just a mean, nasty person. Um, that person is an incorrigible criminal. That person has not responded to chastening. The society, regardless of what the mother's and father says, this is this person's stubborn, rebellious, and doesn't respond to chastening. If it's true of the family, how much more is it true of society in general? So there's a place for putting the 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 incorrigible criminal, they're known as, putting them out of misery. I mean, what do you do? There are certain people they just they don't ever they don't murder people, but they're constantly, many, many times. They've been incarcerated. The recidivism is high. They go back and they go back and they go back. And it's, it's lots of crimes. Uh, cumulative would be a similar situation to a son who doesn't work, he's a drunkard, and he doesn't respond to chastening. So here it's saying if you find this in the family, the family should be willing to take him to the elders. But if, the, if also society just said, this person is an incorrigible criminal, they've been warned, and they're just making life miserable for the whole community, then take them to the rock pile. Because if you don't, what's going to happen? If you don't get rid of incorrigible criminals, what's going to happen? It's going to spread. Like leprosy. leprosy. It's going to spread like leprosy in society, and you're going to have street gangs of people that go around beating people up and breaking windows and and doing this. So, um, And a lot of times those are fatherless people because uh, most people in prison today are fatherless. It's talking about people that have a mother and father. There's a reason for that. You take the father out of the home, you take the discipline, disciplinarian. Sometimes mothers are good disciplinarians, but m- many cases it's the father who's the chief disciplinarian. Mother needs to be a good disciplinarian and should be, and, and it is nurturing to, to lovingly discipline. But... Um, if that's the case, you, you know, you got to put away the evil from your midst or it spreads. And that's the whole point of this is that uh, verse 21, Then all the men of the city shall stone him to death with stones, so you shall purge the evil from your midst, and Israel shall hear and fear. It has a deterrent effect. If, 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 if somebody's just being an absolute scoundrel on society and you put them to death, then everybody goes, that's what we do to people that are bullies who are damaging private property for no good reason, and they're not working, so they're getting fed somehow. They're stealing somebody's chickens. Just take them to the rock pile and put them out of our misery. <laughs> that's right. You know, so that's, that's another solution. I think another application for modern day would be um, incorrigible criminals. And by the way, Rush Dooney points out that in many states, like in the North, even in California, up and up until maybe the early 1900s, there was like a, a three kind of a three strikes policy, where if you had somebody who was constantly committing certain crimes, then they would they would hang them. Uh, common one that you didn't have to do it multiple times. If you were a cattle rustler, they hang you. 
And people today say, oh, that's, you know, that's theft, so that shouldn't be hung. Well, actually, it's not just theft. It was a murderous act because if you steal someone's horse on, prairie, on the prairie, you, you may be consigning them to death because they couldn't get the necessary food. They couldn't plow their field. If they broke their leg, they couldn't get to safety. Um, it, for a variety, if you stole someone's horse, you may be taking their life. And so they said, fine, we're going to hang horse thieves. But um, that's what they did in order to keep crime down because if there's no fear then people can be incorrigible criminals because they're like, ah, I don't usually get caught. And when I do, if it's a little fine, a little slap on the wrist, crime is worth it. We don't want crime to be worth it. All right, that's pretty much all I have to say for tonight. I didn't get as far as I thought it would. I thought I'd finish this, but we got one more very interesting verse in this chapter. Maybe I'll combine it with the next. Yeah, oh, yeah, please. Yeah, I believe this is a very good point to bring out to people who believe or make the argument that all humans are good at heart just reminding them, I'm like, well, do you have children? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, did your children start off good or did they start off as dirty sinners? And just bringing out the point that you have to train your children to be good rather than, you know, training them to be evil in a sense. It's, that's, that's right. A, a child left to himself will bring mother shame. And I do believe that, you know, I, I hope I'm not overemphasizing the, the um, negative side of this. I think I think the, the most powerful aspect of child training is being what you want to see. Be what you want to see in your children. So if you're, if you're sowing anger and lack of self-control and you're going around cursing all the time and you're abusing your body with substances, whatever they are or whatever, you're, you're sowing that into your children. You can't sow it in and then expect to spank it out. But, um, but yeah, the, the heart of man is bent on sin. It's, it's, there, there is a depravity in the human heart, and where it, the, the weeds of sin naturally grow, and they have to be like a gardener. He didn't have to plant weeds in the garden. They're going to show up. He has to, be, he has to be pulling out the weeds as they come up. And children are like gardens. You've got to you gotta, you gotta water, and you've got to fertilize, but you also have to pull weeds. That's part of child training. And if you train them, uh, you have many promises and many principles in Scripture uh, to expect good results. I was so discouraged. When I was a teenager, I thought, I don't want to have children because I just look around at all the Christian kids around me and they're just a wreck. And preacher's kids were known for being sometimes the worst. And I thought, well, what's wrong? Well, you know, 40 hours a week in a humanist classroom, uh, another, you know, 30-something hours in front of garbage TV, uh, hanging out with a bunch of kids that, that smoke. And, and um, I'm talking kids that smoke. I'm talking middle school kids were smoking and cursing and beating, fighting, and saying every na they, the, the nastier the word, the more proud they were of it. And, uh, you know, you, you're walking, your companion fools will suffer harm, you know. So, um, but, but if you... If you really look to God's word as a, your source and you train them the way that God's word says so and you do it with faith and you also preach the gospel to them, then I, I, I think we should expect our children to, to grow up in righteousness and not to go astray. But 80-something percent of American Christian kids are going astray. And, and so, uh, and I think it's because the modern church isn't taking heed according to God's word. God gives us the tools. He gives us the principles in his word. And yes, it's God's spirit that regenerates, but God uses means, including the preaching and teaching of parents who pray over their children and catechize their children, teach their children, and they, 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 preach the, they speak the law to them and they reprove them and they speak gospel and grace to them and forgiveness to them. Um, I, I, if I didn't... If, Anyway, there's a lot of hope when you take heed according to your word. But most parents don't even bother to read God's word on child training. That's why I bought those 30-something books. And if I need to buy more, I will. I will need to buy more. <laughs> Please read them. Uh, parents with children and young couples, young, young people, read them. I, I was reading books on that before I even had a wife in, in view. I was reading some books because I wanted something different than what I saw all around me because I saw a lot of apostasy around me and um, I had siblings that weren't living for the Lord didn't want to have anything to do with the Lord and I think that God's people just act like oh you just keep them fed and you bring them to church once a week and they'll grow up Christians no 
parents have a massive role in preaching to their children and training them in the discipline and admonition of the Lord. Oh, that's a scripture I left out. Ephesians 6. I quit. I promise. I read this and quit. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring up Bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You can tell I had my KJV still on there. Bring them up in the discipline and the admonition of the Lord. All righty. Uh, Stephen, would you close us tonight? Let's do it.